The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 92 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descended life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. This planet has, or rather had, a problem, which was this. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much most of the time. Many solutions were suggested for this problem but most of these were largely concerned with the movements of small green pieces of paper. Which is odd, because on the whole it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. And so the problem remained. Lots of people were mean, and most of them were miserable. Even the ones with digital watches. Many were increasingly of the opinion that they'd made a big mistake in coming down from the trees in the first place and some said that even the trees had been a bad move, that no one should have ever left the oceans. And then, one Thursday, nearly 2,000 years after one man had been nailed to a tree for saying how great it would be to be nice to people for a change, a girl sitting on her own in a small cafe in Rickmansworth suddenly realised what it was that had been going wrong all this time. And she finally knew how the world could be made a good and happy place. This time it was right. It would work, and no one would have to get nailed to anything. Sadly, however, before she could get to a phone to tell anyone about it, a terrible, stupid catastrophe occurred, and the idea was lost forever. This is not her story. But it is the story of that terrible, stupid catastrophe and some of its consequences. It is also the story of a book. A book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Not an Earth book, never published on Earth, and until the terrible catastrophe occurred, never seen or even heard of by any Earthmen. Nevertheless, a wholly remarkable book. In fact, it was probably the most remarkable book ever to come out of the great publishing corporation of Ursa Minor, of which no Earthman had ever heard either. Not only is it a wholly remarkable book, it is also a highly successful one, more popular than the Celestial Home Care Omnibus, better selling than 53 more things to do in Zero Gravity, and more controversial than Ulan Kalufid's trilogy of philosophical blockbusters. Where God Went Wrong, some more of God's greatest mistakes, and who is this God person anyway? In many of the more relaxed civilizations of the outer western rim of the galaxy, the Hitchhiker's Guide has already supplanted the great Encyclopedia Galactica as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom. For though it has many omissions and contains much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate, it scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important respects. First, it is slightly cheaper And secondly, it has the words, Don't Panic, inscribed in large, friendly letters on its cover. But the story of this terrible, stupid Thursday, the story of its extraordinary consequences, and the story of how these consequences are inextricably intertwined with this remarkable book, begins very simply. It begins with a house. Chapter 1 The house stood on a slight rise just above the edge of the village. It stood on its own and looked out over a broad spread of West Country farmland. Not a remarkable house by any means. It was about thirty years old, squattish, squarish, made of brick, and had four windows set in the front of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye. The only person for whom the house was in any way special was Arthur Dent and that was only because it happened to be the one he lived in. He had lived in it for about three years, ever since he had moved out of London because it had made him nervous and irritable. He was about thirty as well, tall, dark-haired, and never quite at ease with himself. The thing that used to worry him most was the fact that people always used to ask him what he was looking so worried about. He worked in local radio, 
which he always used to tell his friends was a lot more interesting than they probably thought. It was, too. Most of his friends worked in advertising. On Wednesday night, it had rained very heavily. The lane was wet and muddy, but the Thursday morning sun was bright and clear as it shone in on Arthur Dent's house, for what was to be the last time. It hadn't properly registered yet with Arthur that the council wanted to knock it down and build a bypass instead. At eight o'clock on Thursday morning, Arthur didn't feel very good. He woke up bleary, got up, wandered blearily around his room, opened a window, saw a bulldozer, found his slippers, and stomped off to the bathroom to wash. Toothpaste on the brush, so scrub, shaving mirror, pointing at the ceiling, he adjusted it. For a moment it reflected a second bulldozer through the bathroom window. Properly adjusted, it reflected Arthur Dent's bristles. He shaved them off, washed, dried, and stomped off to the kitchen to find something pleasant to put in his mouth. Kettle, plug, fridge, milk, coffee. Yawn. The word bulldozer wandered through his mind for a moment in search of something to connect with. The bulldozer outside the kitchen window was quite a big one. He stared at it. Yellow, he thought, and stomped off back to his bedroom to get dressed. Passing the bedroom, he stopped to drink a large glass of water, and another. He began to suspect that he was hungover. Why was he hungover? Had he been drinking the night before? He supposed that he must have been. He caught a glint in the shaving mirror. Yellow, he thought, and stomped on to the bedroom. He stood and thought, the pub, he thought. Oh dear, the pub. He vaguely remembered being angry. Angry about something that seemed important. He'd been telling people about it. Telling people about it at great length, he rather suspected. His clearest visual recollection was of glazed looks on other people's faces. Something about a new bypass he'd just found out about. It had been in the pipeline for months, only no one seemed to have known about it. Ridiculous. He took a swig of water. It would sort itself out, he'd decided. No one wanted a bypass. The council didn't have a leg to stand on. It would sort itself out. God, what a terrible hangover it had earned him, though. He looked at himself in the wardrobe mirror. He stuck out his tongue. Yellow, he thought. The word yellow wandered through his mind in search of something to connect with. Fifteen seconds later, he was out of the house and lying in front of a big yellow bulldozer that was advancing up his garden path. Mr. L. Prosser was, as they say, only human. In other words, he was a carbon-based bipedal life form descended from an ape. More specifically, he was forty, fatted shabby, and worked for the local council. Curiously enough, though he didn't know it, he was also a direct male line descendant of Genghis Khan. Though intervening generations and racial mixing had so juggled his genes that he had no discernible mongoloid characteristics, and the only vestiges left in Mr. L. Prosser of his mighty ancestry were a pronounced stoutness about the tum and a predilection for little fur hats. He was by no means a great warrior, in fact he was a nervous worried man. Today he was particularly nervous, and worried because something had gone seriously wrong with his job, which was to see that Arthur Dent's house got cleared out of the way before the day was out. "'Come off it, Mr. Dent,' he said. "'You know you can't win, you know. You can't lie in front of a bulldozer indefinitely.' He tried to make his eyes blaze fiercely, but they just wouldn't do it. Arthur lay in the mud and squelched at him. I'm game, he said. We'll see who rusts first. I'm afraid you're going to have to accept it, Mr. Prosser, gripping his fur hat and rolling it round the top of his head. This bypass has got to be built and it's going to be built. First I've heard of it, said Arthur. Why's it got to be built? Mr. Prosser shook his finger at him for a bit, then stopped and put it away again. What do you mean, why's it got to be built? he said. It's a bypass. You've got to build bypasses. Bypasses are devices which allow some people to dash from point A to point B very fast, whilst other people dash from point B to point A very fast. 
People living at point C, being a point directly in between, are often given to wonder what's so great about point A. What's so great about point A that so many people from point B are so keen to get there? And what's so great about point B that so many people from point A are so keen to get there? They often wish that people would just once and for all work out where the hell they want to be. Mr. Prosser wants to be a point D. Point D wasn't anywhere in particular. It was just any convenient point a very long way from points A, B and C. He would have a nice little cottage at point D, with axes over the door, and spend a pleasant amount of time at point E, which would be the nearest pub to point D. His wife, of course, wanted climbing roses, but he wanted axes. He didn't know why, he just liked axes. He flushed hotly under the derisive grins of the bulldozer's drivers. He shifted his weight from foot to foot, but it was equally uncomfortable on each. Obviously, someone had been appallingly incompetent, and he hoped to God it wasn't him. Mr. Prosser said, You were quite entitled to make any suggestions or protests at the appropriate time, you know. Appropriate time? hooted Arthur. Appropriate time? The first I knew about it was when a workman arrived at my home yesterday. I asked him if he'd come to clean the windows, and he said no, he'd come to demolish the house. He didn't tell me straight away, of course. Oh, no. First he wiped a couple of windows and charged me a fiver. Then he told me. But, Mr. Dent, the plans have been available in the local planning office for the last nine months. Oh, yes. Well, as soon as I heard, I went straight around to see them yesterday afternoon. You hadn't exactly gone out of your way to call attention to them, had you? I mean, actually telling anybody or anything. But the plans were on display. On display? I eventually had to go down to the cellar to find them. That's the display department. With a torch. Ah, well, the lights had probably gone. And so had the stairs. But luck, you found the notice, didn't you? Yes, said Arthur. Yes, I did. It was on display in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet stuck in a disused lavatory with a sign on the door saying, Beware of the leopard. A cloud passed overhead. It cast a shadow over Arthur Dent as he lay propped up on his elbow in the cold mud. It cast a shadow over Arthur Dent's house. Mr. Prosser frowned at it. It's not as if it's a particularly nice house, he said. I'm sorry, but I happen to like it. You'll like the bypass. Oh, shut up, said Arthur Dent. Shut up and go away, and take your bloody bypass with you. You haven't got a leg to stand on, and you know it. Mr. Prosser's mouth opened and closed a couple of times whilst his mind was for a moment filled with inexplicable but terribly attractive visions of Arthur Dent's house being consumed with fire and Arthur himself running screaming from the blazing ruin with at least three hefty spears protruding from his back. Mr. Prosser was often bothered with visions like these and they made him feel very nervous. He stuttered for a moment and then pulled himself together. Mr. Dent, he said. Hello? Yes, said Arthur. Some factual information for you. Have you any idea how much damage that bulldozer would suffer if I just let it roll straight over you? How much, said Arthur. None at all, said Mr. Prosser and stormed nervously off, wondering why his brain was filled with a thousand hairy horsemen all shouting at him. By a curious coincidence, none at all is exactly how much suspicion the ape descendant Arthur Dent had that one of his closest friends was not descended from an ape, but was in fact from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, and not from Guildford as he had usually claimed. Arthur Dent had never, ever suspected this.